Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, uh, let me uh, introduce this uh, seminar. Of course, it's uh, the phone call, excuse me. Uh, people that I, I called just a few minutes up in the calls now. Uh, this uh, seminar on BCI that is uh, supported uh, by our guests, uh, Dr. Uger and uh, this is the company that is uh, show here, GTEC. And uh, uh, the seminar uh, is uh, the opportunity to uh, go deeply in the BCI technologies to have an overview concerning the opportunity of research and the opportunity to, to uh, the afternoon we'll have uh, practical sessions and we'll have the possibility to make brainstorming concerning uh, these, uh, uh, these technologies. So this uh, seminar is more, I, I expect, is a, a, an informal, not formal workshop, but an informal workshop because uh, it's not uh, a lecture of Chris Huger, of myself and Fabrizio and so on, but it's uh, a, 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 a opportunity to, to discuss all together concerning this idea. In these uh, rooms, and my, uh, my speech is just for uh, introduce one each other, in this room we have mainly students of biomedical engineer in the last year. So students that are just a little bit before to get their final thesis. So this seminar is the opportunity to have to look for which thesis can get in order to have an overview concerning a challenge for themselves. And I look forward that I spoke with them just a few minutes before just to invite them to, to stay, to pay attention, to, to be curious today, and to ask, to make questions. So please, there is a, stop us, uh, make questions, because to have just uh, uh, all the, the information we need for clarify, which is uh, the, 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 the area of discussion. Then we have uh, some scientists. They have three neurologists that come from Southern University of Naples. It, uh, they are scientists concerning uh, uh, sclerosis lateral amyotrophic. I hope to, this is well, well speech. Amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. And they are neuroscientists. They have previous experience concerning fMRI and pay a big interest concerning BCI. Of course, they join us for other research. You can consider, for instance, the opportunity to spend some time for their thesis with them, because, uh, of course, uh, you, you could spend some time, for instance, even in their company with uh, a possibility to make uh, some uh, uh, internship uh, abroad and so on. There are different possibilities, okay? And then we have uh, here Professor Fabrizio Esposito, that is, is, is an ex-student from this university, now is professor at the University of Salerno, and I think uh, is uh, probably the biomedical engineer more expert concerning fMRI in Italy at the moment. And uh, is a, uh, a good man, is a a, 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 a good scientist, is professor, and is engaged with us in in this team and uh, cooperate with us. And you could spend some time with him for making research at the University of Salerno. So it's a is an area of cooperation that we look forward for establish today on this uh, on this area. And he will introduce uh, after uh, uh, Professor Guger some concerns, uh, the fMRI, just for looking forward, possibility of joint integration between BCI and fMRI. Uh, now, uh, this, the, uh, uh, the, the attendance. 
Now I leave uh, uh, the speech to Professor Huger that we introduce BCI technologies. After that, uh, uh, Professor Esposito will introduce uh, fMRI technologies, just for knowing this is one which the equipment does, how the, the, the brain works. And then I will speak concerning the possibility that what is the contest of rehabilitation where we uh, look forward for use BCI technologies and some concerns what we have done in the past, uh, some dissertation thesis, so two students will speak about their thesis on BCI just for discussing what's, uh, which problem we get and so on. Okay? And uh, in all this speech, please stop if you have some questions to do and so on. Okay? So, please, Ralph, yes, your speech. Thank you very much for organizing the workshop. Um, the title of the talk is Non-Invasive and Invasive Brain-Computer Interfaces today. You can see also my daughter, when she was one year old, playing with our biosignal amplifiers that we use for brain-computer interface experiments. And you can imagine that's the most expensive Lego that you can buy. Um, so today I would like to mention the four concepts that you can use for realizing a BCI system. I will also introduce functional mapping with invasive technology called ECOG where you need a neurosurgeon uh, implanting the grids, the electrode grids on the cortex. And then I will uh, mention applications like stroke rehabilitation, coma assessment, and also avatar control with brain-computer interfaces. So we have a couple of companies. The first one, Google Technologies, is located in Graz. And that's the company doing the research projects, mostly from the European Commission. And GTEC Medical Engineering, it's located in the north. This is close to Linz. And this company is doing the international sales. So you have to be careful if you meet somebody from GTEC, they want to sell you something. But it's safe to speak with somebody from Google Technologies. And we have also an office in Barcelona because we have a couple of research projects going on in Spain. So it's easier for us to work together uh, directly from Barcelona. So here, it's not so difficult to explain where Austria is located. We don't have kangaroos, but we have Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in Salzburg. We have some castles in, v in Vienna. And we have a clock tower in Graz, which was destroyed by Napoleon Bonaparte some years ago. And you can also see the, the spot in Barcelona where we are located. Um, we have a couple of research projects that you uh, going on at the moment, and I would just like to mention a few of them. So the first one in Rena chip, we were using brain-computer interfaces to replace a certain function of the cerebellum of a rat. So the brain-computer interface was making decisions like the cerebellum for, for a paralyzed rat, more or less. Then in Brainable, for example, we are constructing brain-computer interfaces to control virtual reality environments and social networks like Facebook and Twitter. And maybe the last one that I want to mention is Vare, where we control avatars with the BCI systems. So the idea is that you can send your personal avatar to other places and the avatar is doing tasks for you. Um, so this Verre project uh, will be introduced in a couple of slides today. I will show you a couple of videos. Um, the coordinator of the project is Mel Slater from the University of Barcelona. He is one of the pioneers in virtual reality. Actually, he was the person who first built a cave system in London. And inside the project, we are call, uh, uh, controlling virtual avatars in virtual reality, but we have also real robotic avatars that you can send around. We also got a couple of awards for the technology. Maybe the biggest one is the Microsoft Innovation Award a couple of years ago. And if you want to do brain-computer interface experiments, you need, of course, a subject or a patient. You are recording EEG data or ECOG if you have a neurosurgeon doing the implants for you. The brain-computer interface is generating a control signal in real time so that you can move, for example, a cursor on the screen. 
And this is very important because it gives feedback to the user. So if you see the cursor movement, you can learn to control the BCI system better. Like normally if you learn something, if you see what you're controlling, your performance is better. There are many different applications. Maybe the most useful one at the moment is the spelling device, which allows locked in patients to select characters and form words and sentences on the computer screen. You can use it for prosthetic hand control, for controlling mobile phones, like Nokia is doing it. You can play games. In this picture, two people are hooked up to the BCI system to play ping pong. Many people do art installations recently, so you can paint with playing computer interfaces, you, you can generate music. In Japan, of course, they control robotic devices. We use it very often in virtual reality because it's a very nice simulation environment where you can test your brain-computer interface and you can also test patients if they are able to control it. And recently, uh, many people use it for stroke rehabilitation um, to have a better outcome after the accident. A couple of years ago, I was also doing a workshop in Mexico City. In the middle, you can see Oscar Suarez, a famous BCI researcher. But interesting is the EEG machine in the corner of the room, which has a lot of dials and uh, gouges for uh, performing, setting the amplification. And they have a very nice concept. They have a little Madonna on the machine praying for a long life of the EEG equipment. So at GTEC, we do it a little bit differently. We design electronic devices, biosignal amplifiers. You can see we do it very quickly. And we designed these amplifiers to be able to record EEG data on the surface, but also to record directly from the cortex with invasive technology. And you can also put needle electrodes into the brain to record from single cells. And you can, all, uh, you can record all these signals at the same time. And that's very important to learn from each other. And it also opens a lot of different applications that you can control with the brain-computer interface. Um, recently, we developed also a wireless system, which I have also on the table, and I would like to demo it in a couple of minutes. Important is that all the electrodes, active electrodes, are sitting on the head. So each little red electrode has already an amplifier inside, and this gives a very nice data quality combined with the biosignal amplifier that's sitting here. That's also an ADC and the wireless transmission with 2.4 gigahertz like your mobile phone is using. And important is that everything is sitting on the head and therefore you get very nice EEG data and not many movement artifacts. You can even run a little bit, you can jump a little bit while you are doing experiments. There is also a, a tri-electrode version. So in the other picture we needed electrode jail for preparing the skin in this uh, version. We just have golden pins to penetrate the skin and then the preparation is much quicker. You will see in a couple of minutes. Uh, if you want to do BCI research or BCI experiments, you should also have a BCI lab. And here you can see a plan what you would need for doing it. So normally you put the person in the middle of the room into a comfortable chair. Then just behind the head is the biosignal amplifier so that you have uh, short wires to reduce artifacts. The amplifier is connected to a real-time processing system, that's the BCI system itself. And the brain-computer interface is connected to a normal computer screen for giving feedback, but you can also have head-mounted displays for stereoscopic effects. Or you can also have virtual reality system to have highly immersive environments and life-sized avatar, for example. And at the same time, you can do also electrical stimulation, haptic stimulation, audio stimulation. You can use microphones or eye tracker to log user responses. And this is all speaking with each other in real time. So you can fully automate your experiment. And you can also control, for example, an exoskeleton or a rehabilitation training device if you work, for example, with spinal cord injury patients or with stroke patients. Important uh, for doing BCI experiments is, of course, to record EEG data as quickly 
and robustly as possible. And I show you a video how this nowadays looks like. So the, we developed recently a 256 channel biosignal amplifier that's sending the data via USB to the computer. So it's pretty portable. And you can see that all the electrodes are already connected to the cap and to the recording software. So all what you have to do is when a new patient comes in, you put on the cap, you close the chin strap, then you make sure that the cap fits the head. And then you take a syringe with the electrode shell inside and you fill each of the active electrodes. So again, here each electrode has already an amplifier inside. That's very important because we can do recordings with very high electrode impedances. And therefore we don't have to clean or abrade the skin, which can hurt and also take some time. So basically you're just injecting the jail. It takes about one second. And here you can already see the recording software. Uh, here we have we just have noise because the jail is not injected yet. But here you can see the first channels are already coming to baseline. This takes about 30 seconds because we use a high pass filter of 0.1 hertz. And for that reason it takes about 30 seconds to adjust. Um, now you can see we have about 10 channels already assembled. And I just move a little bit forward in the video. We don't have to see everything. And after five minutes, you can see that most of the channels already show EEG data. He is working on the last few channels. And after about five minutes and 30 seconds, we are done with the preparation of the EEG system, in this case with 64 channels. Uh, he's just doing the last few, and now we do some easy testing to check if the EEG data is nice. So we ask the person to blink. Here you see a few eye movements, then to clench T's. You can see here muscle contamination, which is on all the channels. And after five minutes and 53 seconds, we are done with the assembling of 64 channels. A few years ago, like three years ago, you needed about an hour for doing that. Now you can do it within five minutes. I'm sure he lost one minute because he didn't prepare enough jail. And this is very nice because you can do a high resolution EEG recording in your BCI experiment. It gives you a lot of data for offline analysis or for better performance. Any questions so far? No? You, you can also ask in Italian language and somebody will translate if you prefer, just to let you know. So there are four concepts that you can use for realizing a BCI system. First, you can use slow cortical potentials. This means you're modulating very slow waves of the EEG signal with some neurofeedback training. Uh, this takes pretty long, a couple of weeks or months to learn it, and it's not very robust and accurate. That's also the reason why it's not used nowadays anymore, but it was the first principle used for BCIs. Then you can use steady state visual evoked potentials, where you have, for example, a LED flickering with 10 hertz, you look at the LED and the same frequency will be induced in your EEG data. So you will see a 10 hertz peak and a fast Fourier transformation and you know the person is looking at the LED and this is your control signal. You can also use event-related non-phase lock changes of oscillations. That's a very complicated name but basically you ask the person to imagine a right hand movement, a foot movement, a left hand movement. And this is uh, modulating your alpha and beta oscillations in the brain, and the BCI system is detecting it. And the last principle are the evoke potentials, for example, a P300 response that we will also uh, experience in the afternoon. So we have a practical experiment where we use the P300 response. I have also another video which shows the application of dry electrodes where you don't need the preparation with the jail. 
So it's the same setup as before. We have the brain computer interface, a biosignal amplifier that we will also use in the afternoon, a cap with 16 uh, tri electrodes already inserted. Everything is already connected to the system. So the patient is coming in. And now he is fixing the crown and the reference on the mastoids. This is the bone that you can feel behind your ears. And then he is just uh, twisting each of the electrodes a little bit to make sure that the electrode pins go through the hair and touch the skin. And after about 30 seconds, we are done with 30 channels, with 16 channels, and we do the same testing like before. So we ask the person to clench teeth. So here you see the muscle activity again. And we ask him to blink. So here you see eye blinks, mostly on the frontal channels because they are closer to the eyes. And after 53 seconds, we are done with the assembling and testing. And you can run your BCI experiment. But very nice is that you don't have to give the patient a hair wash afterwards. So here you can see the electrodes with the pins. And the golden pins just go through the hair and touch the skin. And this gives you pretty nice EEG data. And here I would like to do a demo so that you can see in real time how it looks like. Could you maybe come to this place? There's also a, a so-called Switch it on. Okay. And now you can see here a yellow cable. This is the grounding electrode of the amplifier. Every biosignal amplifier needs a ground potential, otherwise you cannot measure voltage. And this is normally mounted on the left mastoid. So this is just the bone behind the left ear. And on the other side, you can see a blue electrode, that's the reference. So if we measure the voltage, then every single electrode, which is located here, is measured against this uh, reference electrode. So the reason for having a ground and a reference is to have a higher common mode rejection ratio, which means the amplifier is able to suppress, for example, power line interference, or other electrical signals which are interfering with the EEG signal. And then I have to twist each of the electrodes a little bit just to make sure that the electrode goes through the hair. So in his case, the cap fits pretty well. So all the electrodes are fine. Okay, and now I can hold it again. Grazie. And... I just have to switch the beamer to my computer. Okay. I keep 
keep this resolution and now I start up the GTAC data server which is screening inside the, the room if there are any wireless systems uh, available. I already switched the little box, the amplifier and transmission unit on. And you can see it finds a Nautilus with a certain serial number. So if you have multiple devices, the serial number helps you to identify which system is which one. And then I just select the Nautilus system. Takes a little bit to establish the wireless connection. And this is now already the configuration window for the wireless system. So here I can select, for example, the sensitivity of the amplifier that I want to use. Here you can see a list with 32 channels. They have names according to the 1020 international electrode system. So this is, for example, position C set. And if I know the position, then I can remember it where the electrode was located. And of course, it allows also to compare different publications and studies what they were doing. So I changed the sensitivity. I could also do bipolar derivation, which means I'm subtracting electrodes from each other. But I select a bandpass filter from 2 hertz to 30 hertz. So this will remove everything below 2 hertz and above 30 hertz. And I use also a notch filter uh, to suppress power line interference. So here in Europe, we have 50 hertz. So this means there's a band stop filter at 50 hertz to get rid of any power line interference that we might have. OK, then I confirm the settings. Takes a little bit, and I start the acquisition of the data. Maximize the screen. And what you can see here is already some EG data. So this is now from the first 11 channels. And they are mostly close to his eyes. And now I ask you to blink a few times. Now you can see the, the artifacts in the data. So these are blinking movements. So this was a movement artifact that you can see here. Blink again. And here you can see the, the blinks. Then I scroll down a little bit. So these are channels mostly over the visual cortex on the back of the head. And now I ask you to clench teeth. Clench. So here you see muscle contamination. It's on all the channels because these muscles here have about the same distance to all the recording electrodes that we have. And now please close your eyes and relax. So I don't open again. Let's try it. Just relax and close your eyes. No, he doesn't have an alpha wave. So some people, so either he's not relaxed because of the situation here, or he doesn't have a strong alpha. So there's about 10% of the population who don't have a strong alpha. But let's test it again. Maybe you relax now. Close your eyes. No, we, we don't get a nice alpha, but it uh, doesn't matter. And now think about your wife. Think about your wife, girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, as you like. You see there's no reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I stop again. So this is basically what you have to do uh, for doing the, the wireless recording. So it's pretty fast to put it on. And the nicest thing, of course, is if I'm done, I just remove the cap and I don't have to wash his hair. Uh, I'm happy that I don't have to do. <laughs> Thank you. Very well done. And I just switch it off. Any questions? No?
Okay, and with these uh, gel electrodes and dry electrodes, of course, we did a group study to test the spelling application. That's called Intendix, which was designed for locked in patients or ALS patients. You can see different characters and numbers on the screen, some symbols for copying the text into an editor or into an email or to the loudspeaker. But basically, the different icons are flashing up and you have to look at the icon you want to spell. And every flash is a, producing a P300 response or in the brain that the PCI system is detecting. But more important here is at the moment that we looked at 81 people using the electrode jail based uh, system, and we got a mean accuracy of 91% for all of them after five minutes of training. That's important to mention. And for the, dry, for the dry electrode system, like we were using it today, we got the mean accuracy of 90.4%. So it shows that the electrode jail version and the dry electrode version gives the same uh, accuracy for the spelling application. But you must be more careful if you use the dry electrodes. So you, it's easier to get movement artifacts uh, because the impedance is so high. So under control situation, you get the same data quality, but the restrict, restrictions are higher. So here you can see a picture of Mr. Salzmann, who was an ALS patient in uh, Stuttgart in Germany. And he was the first patient uh, typing a complete letter with a brain-computer interface based on slow waves. He needed a couple of weeks for typing the letter, but nevertheless, he was the first patient doing it. You can also see that he is artificially respirated. You can see the big amplifiers and the big PCs about 15 years ago. And this is Niels Bierbaumer, uh, the head of the department where the study was done. If you are using motor imagery as a concept of BCI control, then you ask people, for example, to imagine a left hand movement. And this is activating the right hemisphere. You can see the red spot here. That's called event-related desynchronization. And basically, the power in the alpha frequency band is decreasing. This means the power around 10 hertz is going down during the imagination. And if you ask the person to do a right-hand movement, you see the activation on the left hemisphere. And the location is almost the same for everybody. And for that reason, we just place the electrodes here for right-hand movement, here for left-hand movement, and here would be, for example, foot movement. So this is very nice because we know electrode locations already in advance. And a couple of years, we had also a spinal cord injury patient, Tom, with a C4, C5 lesion. And I have also a video which shows you what we did with this patient. So this patient was on a language trip in Malta, in the Middle Sea, was swimming around and a big wave turned him upside down and he broke his spinal cord. From this day on, he was paralyzed. So at the beginning, he couldn't speak, he couldn't breathe himself. He couldn't move anything below his neck. But after about six months, he became pretty stable. So he didn't need the respirator anymore. He could speak again and he could move his left biceps to do a hand movement like that, but he was not able to grasp. So the goal of the project was to use a brain-computer interface to restore the hand grasping function so that he can eat himself. So the first thing was to take him to the biomedical engineering department from the Tech University of Technology in Graz, and we did some brain mapping to figure out if he's still able to activate the sensory motor cortex like any healthy person is doing it. So we were asking him to imagine a left-hand movement. If the arrow was pointing to the left-hand side, he tried to extend the cursor to the left-hand side as far as possible. In the meantime, we analyzed the data in real time. Then we asked him to imagine a right-hand movement for a couple of seconds and to extend the cursor to this side. We checked the EG data, if it's nice, of course, there were some calculations. But basically, we figured out that he can activate the sensory motor cortex like any healthy control. For that reason, we installed the BCI system at his home. 
So you can see here the, the house of the family. We trained his parents to assemble EEG electrodes to switch on biosignal amplifiers and PCs. And after two months of training, we figured out if he is doing a both feed movement imagination, then we get the perfect control signal. So he always reaches 100% accuracy if he does the both feed movement imagination. And we had a master student who designed this very simple prosthetic device. It's just made of aluminium, has an electrical motor. It's about 15 years ago, but it was good enough for the proof of concept. And if he's now doing the motor imagination, he can close the hand. And if he does the same Im imagination again, he can open the hand again. And here you can see Tom doing the both feet imagination to grasp. He lifts the Lego cube to another position, which is also very nice for the other muscles, the biceps, to be strengthened. And this is the first apple that he was eating himself after the accident. So like mentioned before, this video is 15 years old, but nowadays we use functional electrical stimulation for him. So the movement patterns are much nicer than with this simple prosthetic device. But the video shows very nice the principle that was used. And nowadays we are using the same concept in two projects. One is VRE, the control of the avatars, and in BEDDER, which deals with stroke rehabilitation. This is together with Mel Slater from University of Barcelona. You can see that we put on a cap with 27 active electrodes overlaying the sensory motor cortex. We inject the electrode shale to have low impedances. Everything is connected in this case to two biosignal amplifiers because we have 27 channels. We are transmitting the data via USB to a computer in this case, we are using MATLAB and Simulink for doing the real-time analysis. So here you see the Simulink model running the BCI experiment. Simulink is very, very fast and allows to do a lot of calculations in real-time. And this is now the calibration. We show a window in the middle of the screen. Like before, the stroke patient imagines a left-hand movement or a right-hand movement. This is repeated 100 times, which takes about 15 minutes. And then he is able to control virtual hands in front of him. This is 3D. You can see here the shutter classes for stereoscopic effects. And then when he is activating the left or the left hand movement area with the BCI system, the hand is doing this movement. And this has a very nice effect on the rehabilitation because he sees the movement. So he has the impression like moving his real hand. And he, this is activating again the sensory motor cortex. He is actively doing the imagination. And we get very nice rehabilitation outcomes with this setup. And nowadays we use also functional electrical stimulation at the same time so that the body is really moving uh, while he's doing the imagination. So up to now we learned that motor imagery works very well for right hand movement, left hand movement, and foot movement. But it's difficult to get more degrees of freedom. And for that we can use the ECOG where we implant electrode grids directly on the cortex. So here you see for example a patient with the ECOG grids already implanted. So this grid has about 40 electrodes for example. And this study here was done by Kai Miller, who is at Stanford University. And he was asking the patient to be at rest and not to do anything. And then he calculated the power spectrum that you can see here. So you can see that the spectrum is going down with increasing frequency. This is the 1 over F damping of the EEG signal when you are not doing anything. Then he asked the patient to do a hand movement. He calculated the power spectrum again. You can see it here in red. And interesting is, of course, to compare the blue and the red line. So in the low, in the low frequency band, this is the band that we already know from the EEG. We see that the resting E has a higher power than the hand movement. This is the event-related desynchronization that I explained already before. But interesting is now that we can also investigate the high frequency band. This is gamma activity. 
above 80 hertz. And here we have the opposite. So doing the hand movement, the power is higher than doing rest. And this is called high task related high gamma activity. And this is a very nice control signal for BCI systems. Interesting is also for the low frequency band here, we need a very large cortical network for producing the activity. But for the high frequency band, we just need a very small spot, more or less one electrode coding the information. So based on this knowledge, Kai did another recording with this patient. And he was just investigating three electrodes, which are shown here in color. And then he used a data cloth to track uh, body movement. So we were, he was asking the patient to move six times the dump, a couple of times the index finger, a couple of times the little finger. And then he was reconstructing the movements from the electrodes shown on the picture. So in this case, he used the dark blue electrode to reconstruct the movement. And you can see the movement patterns match very well. Especially the onset is very pronounced because it's a new task for the cortex that it has to do. And therefore, we get a lot of high gamma activity if you do a new task. Same is the case for the index finger and for the little finger. And you can also see that we don't have false positives in between, which is very nice. So we learned that ECOG allows us to distinguish even different fingers. This is a task that's totally impossible with EEG data because you don't have the resolution on the surface. But how fast can you find these regions? Because you don't know which electrode is coding which information. And for that, you can use a functional mapping procedure, which was developed by Gerwin Schalk. I show you a video so that you see how this is working. So we, ha we have an epilepsy patient located here in the bed. He's solving Rubik's cube with his hands. And at the same time, we are recording the ECOG. And we do some functional mapping of the high gamma activity. So the little dots are the electrode grids implanted in the patient. And you can see after a few seconds, the red circles are adjusting to a certain state. And the circle means that this region, for example, is coding the hand movements. Here you can see the instruction for the patient. So now he is uh, sticking in and out the tongue, performing tongue movements. And again, after a few seconds, the circles are converging to a certain state. And they identify the most important electrodes for tongue movement. Then we ask the patient to stop and relax again, to have a baseline period. It takes about 10 seconds. And then he's doing a kissing movement, just moving the lips around like he's kissing. So of course, the kissing and sticking out the tongue is related to each other. So the, the cortical regions are very similar. And the last task is to listen to a story. After a couple of seconds listening to a story, we have identified the auditory cortex. And this all together is very important information for a neurosurgeon because he knows the most important regions where they are located. So if he does a surgery and removes some brain tissue, then he tries not to touch, for example, the auditory cortex because if he's removing this section of the brain, then he's not able to understand and language anymore, or he cannot speak anymore. If he removes this section, the person cannot do uh, movements anymore. So that's called the eloquent cortex. And this functional mapping software is intended to give you these most important regions. Yeah, we validated the system also with electrical current stimulation and functional MRI, but I just skip 
some of these slides and come to the conclusion. So the ECOG gives us a very high resolution, but it's invasive. And how can we get many choices on the surface with doing EG recordings? And for that, you can use the P300 potential for the spelling application, like already mentioned before. So you show a, a matrix with different characters and numbers, and you tell the person, for example, look at the W and count how many times the W is flashing up. And then all the icons are highlighted randomly for a very short time period. And as soon as the W appears, your brain is responding with the green curve shown here. So the red line is the time point when the W appeared on the screen. And your brain response is about 230 milliseconds delayed. And it has an amplitude of about 7 microvolt. So it's very tiny. And you can also see the blue line here. This is the brain response for all the other characters, A, B, C, D. So the amplitude is about 2 microvolt. This means the difference between the blue and the green line is about 5 microvolts. And this is what the brain-computer interface has to identify to pick the W. And of course, you want to run a brain-computer interface experiment as fast as possible so that you can type as quickly as possible. And there's a little trick that you can do. Instead of highlighting single characters, you can also highlight a whole row or column at the same time looks like that, and this gives you a speed up of, of six times, so you are six times faster than the mode that I have shown you before. I have also a video explaining this strategy a little bit better. You can see we have a very good brain-computer interface user here. We have eight electrodes, mostly on, the, on this region of the brain, connected to a biosignal amplifier. We check the EEG data if it's nice. In this case, we use Simulink. We're doing the real-time analysis. And this is now the calibration, which is very important for the system. So we enter five characters that the person should copy spell. In this case, shoes. So it doesn't matter which word you use. You should just have five different characters. And your task is now to look at the S, and you count as fast as possible how many times it's flashing up. Like one, two, three, four, five, and every time your brain is responding with the P300 response, and after 45 seconds, we can already make a decision at which character you looked at. And you see the S is selected, and now you move to the next character, which is the H, and you count again. So all together, it takes about five minutes. During the calibration, it's important that you are relaxed, you should not move, you should not speak, you shouldn't have a chewing gum because this is messing up the calibration data. But after this calibration, we can already increase the speed of the BCI system. And now we are spelling GTAC with only two flashes. So the T is here. One, two, decision done. And this is 800 milliseconds per character that we achieved here. Last character is the C. One, two, decision done. And this is already comparable to typing with two fingers on a computer keyboard. So you're not, you're not much faster with two fingers. But it also shows somehow the speed that you can reach with a brain-computer interface because you have to shift from one key to another one fast enough. If you miss one of the flashes, the BCI system is lost, of course. And there's also an, another very nice property. Instead of the characters and numbers, you can also use symbols, like Japanese symbols, and then you can also type in Japanese language. And instead of languages, you can also use symbols, for example, uh, for controlling smart home environments. So there can be symbols for TVs, for phones, and so on, for lights. And based on this principle, we developed this intended system, which is for locked-in patients for communication. And there's also another very nice trick that you can use for the B300 speller. So if you use instead of the black and white matrix faces of famous people, then you can increase the performance. So here we have, for example, Tom Cruise. And if you focus on this character, your brain tries to identify who the person is. 
and your brain is so busy that we get a bigger P300 response. And in this case, we did a group study with 17 subjects and everybody reached 100% accuracy because of this little trick. So this means if you see a, a face, you cannot avoid to try to recognize this person if you met him before or if you know him. And this is boosting performance very nicely. Any questions so far? Uh, so the flashing looks like in the video that I have shown, but in the video we had black and white characters. And with the face speller, we have still the same black and white characters, but they are interleaved with the faces. So you see, for example, the A, then the famous face is coming, then the A again. So the faces are flickering. And as soon as your brain sees the face, it tries to recognize who it is. And this is producing a large P300 response. So the biggest P300 response is produced if your mother is calling your name because you are trained to attend to your mother. It's just complicated for us, you know, to, to have your mother's voice and, and your name implemented. So an easy trick is to use famous faces because they work for most of the people. And this uh, yeah, brain-computer interfaces can also be used for coma patients. If we look at this diagram, and if we have a normal person, then we have normal cognitive functions, and we have also normal motor responses. On the other side of the matrix, we have coma patients who don't have any motor functions and cognitive functions, but they are also a little bit lighter coma patients, which are in the vegetative state or in the minimal consciousness state. So you don't get motor responses usually, but they still have cognitive functions. So they can understand, for example, instructions, but there's no way for you to find this out. And for this reason, we developed a system that's called Mind Beagle, so that we can test if the coma patient still has some uh, cognitive functions left. So in this case, we use, for example, auditory stimulation with the same EEG electrodes that we use for Intendix, for the spelling device beforehand. It's a computer system doing the real-time analysis. And we are just giving different stimuli, like a low tone and a high tone. And we ask the coma patient to count the high tones. And every time the coma patient hears a high tone, a P300 response is detected. And if we find this P300 response for the coma patient and the brain-computer interface tells us 100% accuracy, then we know that the coma patient was understanding our instructions. And this means he is understanding conversations. And this is, of course, very important information for families, but also for the doctor to understand if he's un understanding you. And you can also test with viproductal stimulation, giving also P300 responses or with motor imagery. So up to now, we learned that the P300 gives us many different choices, and it's a goal-oriented approach. I look at the A, and the A is selected. But how can we get a continuous control signal? And for that, we can use steady-state visually evoked potentials. So there's, for example, a LED with 7 hertz. You're looking at the LED. You record the EEG and calculate the power spectrum with a fast Fourier transformation then you find a peak at 7 hertz. You'll find also a peak at 14 hertz, which is the first harmonic component. And this gives you one degree of freedom. So if you want to have two control options, then you use two LEDs with different frequencies. So if the person is looking here, you'll find a peak at 17 hertz, and you can move a cursor, for example, left. And if you find a peak at 14 hertz, you can move a robot to the right-hand side. So that's pretty easy. It works also for six degrees of freedom. You use six LEDs. And Professor Gao from Beijing realized even 48 degrees of freedom with this principle. So I show you also a video that you can see in real time how this looks like. This video is from Dennis Erdogmos from 
uh, Northeastern University in Boston. And he's using a computer screen with four checkerboards. So this checkerboard here is for moving forward, for moving right, for moving left, and for moving backward. And in the middle of the screen, there's a video coming from a small robotic device that's going around in the lab and it's controlled with the brain-computer interface. And that's very nice because you can explore your environment. You see, for example, that the student is not working. That's, that's nice to investigate the lab. So as long as you are looking at the checkerboard that corresponds to forward movement, the robotic system is moving forward. So here you can see it. It's a cheap cleaning robot that you can buy for 200 euros. He fixed the webcam with video streaming on the robotic system. And now he can explore the environment. That's a nice setup for patients because mostly they are located in a room. And if you want to participate, for example, in family life, you can send the little robot around to see what's going on. And this principle is working very well, so we achieve accuracies, mean accuracies of 98.18%, so it's almost perfect. And for this reason, we decided to hook it up also to World of Warcraft. I'll show you also a video of that. So World of Warcraft is an online game, one of the most successful online games existing. Where's my mouse? skip some of the intro. So this is from Blizzard Entertainment. You can see here an avatar that's controlled with the BCI system. So this is your personal avatar. And there are four control options that you got. So you can move your avatar forward, you can turn in left and right, and you can attack other enemies or you can perform actions. Also this little chicken is belonging to you, it's helping you. It's also nice that you can play against each other. It's an online game, and now you can see that the avatar is spotting an enemy over there, and it's starting to attack it, and it also destroys it. And if you ask a patient what they really want to do, they mostly tell you they want to play with their children. And in such an online world, that's very easy because children can be located anywhere, and you can still play together. And very nice is also that you look healthy in the online game. So nobody knows that you are logged in, for example. You look like any other avatar. Okay. So up to now we learned how to use the goal-oriented P300 brain computer interface and the continuous control with SSVPs or with motor imagery. But how can we control avatars? And for that, I will show you a video from the Veré project, which comes from work together with Abdel Keda from CNRS in France. And he's working with this horrible, expensive human robot. So I also have a video here. Oops. So here you can see the robotic system standing in front of a desk where we have a Coke and a Fanta bottle. Here you can see the BCI user, the patient with the screen. And with the BCI system, he made already the decision to grasp the Coke bottle. So the robotic system is pre-programmed. So all the movement patterns for grasping and taking the Coke are pre-programmed. With the BCI system, he's just making the high-level decision to take the Coke and not the Fanta. This is like human beings are doing it. So if I grasp my mobile phone, I don't imagine my hand going down, 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 forward. I just make the high level decision to grasp my mobile phone. Then my body is doing it for me. So this is what we replicated here. And now we are switching into continuous control mode. You can see here four icons. So again, one is for forward movement, one is for left, right, and backward movement. And now you can see the robot moving around. And very important is also that the robot has two cameras here on the head. 
And the PCI user is seeing exactly here what the robot is seeing. So this is like your personal avatar that's exploring remote places and you see what the robotic system is seeing. So the robot is not very fast and Pierre here, one of the students, is just securing the robot because it costs about 1 million euros and if it's falling down then it's destroyed so he is there for security reasons and he's also holding the power supply so they need quite a bit of energy that's the reason for the cable and important is also that the robot has some context awareness so now the, ro the robot recognizes there is a table and it stops automatically and now the BCI system is, is switched to another mode now the BCI user has the option to place the bottle to four different locations so he makes again the decision where he wants to place the coke and afterwards the movement program of the robotic system is called again and automatically the robotic system is placing the coke to a certain position. And very nice is that the robot can learn different tasks and afterwards you are just recalling it with your decisions with the BCI system. This is like a human being, I'm learning to move in a certain way and afterwards I'm just starting the program and it's automatically performed. And there are many different applications for avatars. They are nice for locked in or paralyzed people, of course, but also for healthy users like journalists. There are nice applications. You could send, for example, your robotic avatar to Israel to do some journalistic activities over there for you because you don't want to go into Gaza, for example, or similar stuff. Okay, I would like to stop you. I just show you an image. Uh, this is how you will look like in the afternoon. And you will notice as soon as you put on an EG cap, you look immediately very sexy. So I suggest you to take part in the BCI experiment and to test it yourself. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for Thank you for the presentation. Um, just uh, for a uh, we uh, we have we received a quite uh, a quite large uh, introduction of different uh, different field uh, field of application, and uh, now we have a, a clear idea that a number of things that could be done with BCI. Of course, uh, it's very it's very clear that it is not so easy how it appears to get real application and uh, my opinion is there is uh, still a lot of work and uh, a lot of work to do in order to make these applications really reliable and uh, uh, usable and I look the I see that uh, uh, there are that no more has been told concerning uh, the theoretical basis of BCI uh, this rep uh, he, he, he just for be clear, it's clear to everybody more or less how BCI works in uh, as a principle of application, or there are something, uh, or uh, or you need some uh, further explanation about uh, about that. It's clear to everybody. It's, okay, so we can go ahead, or you need some. Uh, some uh, some explanation concerning the theoretical basis no it's clear sure okay 
Uh, well, now uh, my suggestion is uh, to invite to the chair uh, Fabrizio Esposito and for introducing uh, the views from, uh, uh, from the new imaging side just for have, a, have an idea of understanding of how the brain works. I ask to Fabrizio to explain something how the uh, functional activity can be related to electrical activity that is not probably not so obvious. Because uh, if you have, uh, you, uh, you have seen ma many images that are functional images, but uh, uh, there is not uh, a, a clear relation between uh, if the a, a brain area works and the electrical activity. So Fabrizio will give you our detail, some more details and introduce uh, some item of research concerning uh, the studies on uh, fMRI and uh, the possibly application on BCI. Okay? So pay attention about that and... Uh... Thank you, Sandro, for uh, inviting me in this uh, very interesting uh, uh, workshop uh, where, of course, the topic uh, was uh, brain-computer interface uh, and uh, uh, which is not uh, my um, primary uh, field of interest. However, in the uh, last uh, few years, uh, uh, I got involved in a couple of uh, uh, projects where uh, there is uh, an attempt to uh, bring the uh, knowledge uh, of the brain that we can get uh, uh, from a slightly different aspect. Uh, in perspective in, with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging in the context uh, of uh, BCI. Um, <clears throat> as you have uh, uh, learned from the uh, very nice presentation from Gunther, is uh, uh, brain-computer interface uh, uh, is uh, principally a way, I don't know how this was not put very uh, much in uh, emphasis because the idea was in the, uh, in the part where uh, which is more apparent in the BCI, so the, 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 the stage where we see that our brain activity translates into, uh, into action, into, uh, 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 into some uh, uh, effects, in the, into some communication, okay? Uh, but uh, there was uh, at least one uh, slide uh, quite evident that uh, uh, an important uh, role is uh, uh, played by, uh, was mentioned, the importance of the feedback that we get during uh, uh, the first stage of, of uh, uh, setting up a brain-computer interface, which is called the training stage. So the, the, the stage where the uh, computer learns the brain activity. That's a very crucial state. Well, uh, it has been uh, shown in uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work from the neuroscience literature that may, most of uh, important and specific behavioral effects which we can uh, uh, learn from studying the human behavior, the human behavior uh, depend specifically on which uh, brain region is regulated. This was also uh, quite apparent from previous presentation. Uh, in one of the demo, uh, it was shown uh, that there is an important uh, uh, step for BCI setting, which consists in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, the mapping uh, the brain activity uh, when performing the task. Why? Because we, need, we know that uh, some regions are better than other regions uh, uh, to be targeted for uh, extracting signals and then, and then later on use these signals for uh, controlling the activity. Not because the uh, electrical activity is different, but because those regions are better, are more specifically controlling that behavior. 
uh, all the BCIs you have seen are based uh, on, uh, um, on a system on the uh, direct, <coughs> direct uh, electric activity measurement from the brain. You have seen both uh, non-invasive uh, BCI where the electrodes are placed on, uh, on a scalp, on the scalp, so uh, EG, standard EG-based BCI. And, uh, uh, but you have also seen uh, ECOG-based uh, BCI, so where uh, electrodes are uh, implanted right into the brain on the cortical sheet. That means, uh, of course, these are the invasive BCI, something that we uh, uh, hopefully, uh, most likely, uh, hopefully none of us will uh, be in the need to, to, to try, because this is uh, an application which is uh, strictly uh, uh, limited for uh, uh, patients, actually a special category of patients, which are the uh, pharmacoresistant uh, uh, epileptic patients. No, because uh, I think that... However, uh, uh, um, that was an uh, important step because it was a clear uh, sign of the fact that EEG is uh, quite limited in doing that. Because uh, EEG only uh, measures the activity quite far away from the real source where the activity takes place. And that's a, a, a serious and important limitation. That's why ECOD is also important. Uh, besides the invasive aspect of ECOG, there is another aspect which is, would uh, be probably important to, to point out. The fact that even when we have the chance, and this is limited to patients, as I say, to epileptic patients mainly, in general, but uh, can be, of course, uh, implanted in other patients, uh, even when we use the uh, invasive options of the electrocartography, we still have some limitations. So we can use uh, uh, this so-called grid, this grid of electrodes, which are implanted in a specific place, but still these grids will not cover all, uh, 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 all the uh, possible regions that can uh, be activated during the task. So even if they resolve the problem of uh, uh, giving us the electric activity from the closest point in the brain, so we have not the problem of measuring something very far away from the plane, still we will have some choice, which, which are normally not driven by the uh, 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 BCI tasks, sometimes are driven by other considerations. So you, we have seen how nicely we see the activation of the auditory cortex and the somatosensory cortex, uh, the patient, but we see the activity on that region uh, but those grids can say nothing about other regions which are not covered by the grid. So we also have this other aspect to keep in mind. So uh, tomographic uh, uh, neuroimaging techniques, and uh, among these, and among them, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is the most important, uh, does, does not have this problem. Oh, these problems are much, uh, 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 um, are principally not there because. Uh, um, as, a tomo as all the tomographic uh, uh, techniques, uh, uh, functional magnetic uh, is capable of measuring activity from basically all the place in the, in the, in the brain. And the resolution depends uh, uh, on the magnetic field, and nowadays we can reach resolution uh, in the order of uh, one or less millimeter with ultra high field, magnetic field, seven tesla and higher. That means that we can uh, have the chance to uh, get information about brain activity from uh, uh, all cortical place in principle. And it's totally non-invasive. So we can do fMRI as much as we can, as we like. Uh, for instance, to uh, train uh, a brain-computer interface. So uh, these are the main regions why uh, people in the last 10 years have also, although the literature on BCI is widely, uh, is mainly an uh, EEG or ECOG-oriented uh, uh, literature, there is, also, there is also some ongoing effort in uh, 
developing uh, uh, fMRI base. Uh, what, so all fMRI bases so start, start from the uh, assumption that we can uh, allow via uh, fMRI uh, the volitional control of anatomically well specific region with basically no prior uh, idea, hypothesis of uh, where this region comes from or where we should place a grid and uh, whatsoever. So that's the idea. From the technological point of view, uh, the direction uh, to uh, keep an eye on is the uh, increase in the uh, magnetic field. As I say, as I just said, we have now ultra high magnetic field, seven Tesla and higher, which are uh, spreading around for, uh, mainly for research, uh, which can increase a lot the uh, resolution, and that's also an uh, important aspect for BCI. Uh, the uh, fast data acquisition we can achieve, as we will see in the morning, the real-time uh, acquisition is a crucial uh, aspect of uh, the use uh, of BCI in general. So that's true for EG, that's equally true for fMRI. And uh, standard fMRI uh, setup does not necessarily include real-time imaging. So real-time imaging and fast imaging are uh, aspects which are of a special uh, deal with for uh, BCI researcher and developers. And this, of course, uh, is ma maximally reflected in the research for in signal processing techniques, because uh, signal processing must uh, uh, address the problem of having real-time uh, uh, analysis, and so uh, special algorithm must be uh, uh, developed for real-time processing and uh, uh, for uh, statistical analysis uh, in fMRI. So these are crucial aspects for uh, the use of fMRI in the BCI. As I say, it's non-invasive, uh, and uh, we will talk uh, a bit more uh, about the resolution uh, in another slide. Of course, there are a number of cons which must be clarified, especially to those of you who um, did not have the chance to know closely how uh, magnetic resonance imaging and specifically functional magnetic resonance work. So, of course, uh, the main con is that uh, uh, fMRI is certainly non-portable and cumbersome. If any of you has seen uh, an uh, fMRI a scanner, uh, knows that it's uh, a few tons uh, uh, of weight. And actually, also in terms of space, uh, imagine that ultra-high field scanners can uh, occupy a whole building. So certainly the portability, which one is one uh, major aspect of BCI is certainly not uh, the best of uh, this. As a consequence, the main uh, application that have been developed with fMRI BCIs are a communication application. Uh, communication can be uh, uh, implemented uh, even without uh, moving, so uh, it's something that uh, deserves some attention. But also uh, treatment, uh, treatment uh, uh, with special attention to the uh, feedback uh, aspect, uh, uh, which has been also mentioned in previous talks. So um, feedback, uh, has been, as has been uh, remarked previously, is, is very important in BCI because uh, uh, it reinforces no, the uh, um, performance of the BCI. In, in, in fact, what happens is that this type of feedback, which is called neurofeedback for obvious reason, is actually turning out, uh, thanks to the capability of fMRI of being highly anatomically specific, uh, is turning out to become a treatment, a therapy, which is a clear, uh, uh, very interesting aspect, for, especially for uh, radiologists, because who always uh, uh, have been used to uh, uh, think to MRI as only as a diagnostic tool, thanks to the principle of BCI applied to fMRI, fMRI, besides uh, a diagnostic, can become a therapeutic tool, okay, if properly uh, designed. There is another problem, 
uh, of fMRI. The fact that uh, uh, F, uh, in contrast to uh, EG and uh, of, uh, ECOG, uh, it is an indirect uh, method for measuring electroactivity. So with fMRI, we do not measure directly uh, the electrical activity uh, generated, uh, and so the, elect, uh, the current, the neural current that uh, activates in the, in, the, in the region. So the mechanism is uh, uh, a bit indirect. Uh, when there is some increased neural activity in a region which is, um, is the target, uh, which is the uh, place, the source of the um, uh, activity which has been elicited by the task, no? So when there is some currents flowing in the, in the cortex in a specific place. What happens is that there is an increase in metabolism, in local metabolism of this region. That means, what is metabolism? I mean, when we talk about metabolism, we, we mean basically uh, uh, in, uh, that there is more energy consumption. And this has some uh, hemodynamic consequences. Mainly, the most important one is the fact that there is an increased uh, uh, cerebral blood flow in that region. So there is more uh, uh, flow of uh, blood in that region. Uh, there, uh, there is also an increased uh, uh, local cerebral blood volume, mean, meaning that the uh, micro uh, vessels which uh, uh, bring the blood to the place uh, are increase their volume, okay? And there is also an increase in the uh, concentration of oxygen in the blood, in that, uh, right in that region where the electrical activity is taking place. So this, there is, uh, uh, you see, uh, a, a complex combination of uh, metabolic uh, hemodynamic phenomena which have the net uh, effect of uh, reducing the uh, deoxymoglobin concentration of the uh, blood at that place, as be because deoxymoglobin is uh, uh, paramagnetic. This turns out to uh, reduce the defacing of the uh, MRI signal in that point. Uh, I hope that uh, during the, in the past you had time and the chance to learn how MRI works, at least the principle. Of course, we have not the time to go into details of that. But uh, the basic idea is that uh, after this uh, uh, cascade of uh, uh, processes occur, uh, what happens is that uh, if we acquire uh, uh, data, images, with uh, uh, a special uh, weighting, which is called the T2 star weighting, the signal in that region increase. And that is uh, uh, because we can obtain this uh, uh, T2 star weighting quite fast in, uh, uh, in our uh, acquisition with the modern uh, scanners, uh, modern, with the normal scanner, with clean scanner, scanner also. Uh, if we, uh, what we say in uh, uh, MRI uh, physics, we can acquire these images in one shot, and this shot can be uh, completed in uh, uh, one or two seconds, to have an idea. We can acquire several images, one after the other, in a movie. And so we can detect this effect as increase. That's why uh, if you come to one of our labs where we do fMRI scan, you will see that you don't see only the uh, fMRI scanner. You see uh, all the equipment which is necessary to measure brain activity with fMRI. You will find, uh, let's say, a projection a screen because it's needed in, into the magnet room just to bring the output of the monitor to the, to the subject, which, of course, I am not saying that, but it's obvious, is laying soup in, in, the, in the scanner, so it's not uh, in the comfortable chair in the middle of a room like the uh, BCI guy before. Uh, 
instead of a screen, uh, you can use also uh, more sophisticated Googles, some uh, glasses which you can uh, wear while you are in scanner because they are MRI compatible, and use this for uh, getting the feedback of the of the stimuli and whatsoever. And you see that the uh, data from the scanner console where the the reconstructed image, the image uh, are reconstructed, are uh, also uh, sent to uh, suitable uh, computers for doing the analysis. And this is how uh, a normal, a standard setup for fMRI is look like. Um, without going into the complexity, uh, this slide just summarizes what I have anticipated. So the fact that uh, when, uh, uh, if some regions of the, uh, of the brain change their intensity, well, it's, we only, when we set up our experiment, we only have to uh, be careful to control what happened on the timeline. So when uh, something changed in the stimulus, in the uh, uh, condition of the subject, what we have to detect is this change in the fMRI signal and translate this into uh, 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 activation maps, which will tell us with uh, high uh, and, uh, accuracy and uh, reliability uh, uh, the place where the, um, the uh, phenomenon is, uh, is gained. That's what we, you see, these uh, MRI images with the color maps are statistical uh, uh, maps, so showing uh, in color coding, uh, where the with a certain uh, statistical confidence, uh, the uh, fMRI signal is changed because it's uh, important to specify that uh, the um, the fact that the, the neural activity is not the only uh, reason why uh, the intensity of an MRI image change. There are many other sources of change. There are artifacts also in the fMRI uh, signal. No, as uh, there are the same way, there are artifacts in the G muscle activity and etc. Also in the fMRI, you have many sources of artifacts. So there are many sophisticated methods which help us to uh, 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 separate the uh, real fMRI activity, which is linked to brain activity, which is what we need, and uh, all the other activity. And then there are also a number of other uh, uh, tools that helps us to uh, um, implement the uh, basic analysis uh, uh, steps for the uh, fMRI. As I said, uh, uh, on uh, the, the T2-star images, uh, uh, so the fast images which allows us to record the fMRI activity are called the ecoplanar imaging because ecoplanar is the name of the uh, sequence, the, single, the sequence that you use for getting these T2-star weighted uh, images. Uh, besides the, uh, anatom the uh, EPI, we normally acquire also uh, uh, anatomical images, so static T1-weighted images, which gives us uh, uh, um, normally a better high resolution than EPI. But we, uh, the nice thing is that we combine this. We make what is called the registration process, because by the combination of functional and anatomical images, we can get very high resolution uh, uh, activation images of the brain. That's the, and you see this is made up, this process of many little uh, uh, steps which are implemented in a several uh, software package which uh, normally the people who start working with us uh, start with a training period where they learn how to set up uh, all the, uh, these steps. Um, as I said, uh, the, this, there are a number of steps which are normally applied for showing the activity in the uh, single brain. But as I will uh, show you also uh, later on, uh, it is also very important in order to fully understand what's, what's going on in the brain to uh, put together also uh, data from several brains because this will allow us to understand the uh, neural process much better 
beyond what can be the specific uh, things. For instance, uh, you have seen uh, before how uh, unlucky we were with uh, uh, Mario falling in the 10% of people uh, not showing a good alpha activity. Uh, but uh, if we, instead of taking only Maria, we would take 10 people here, would average this effect, we'll, uh, we will be sure to get much better alpha activity because we will filter out also the, vari uh, the variability of the subject to subject and go more directly to the point when we want to understand the brain. And knowing the brain is ex ex very important, as I say, for uh, designing a BCI. And so there are a number of techniques which also help us to do what we call group analysis. So analyzing the data, mapping the activity for group subject. Uh, the fact that uh, the uh, fMRI response is not a direct uh, uh, reflection of uh, electrical activity, uh, uh, is, uh, um, represents a limitation, uh, not, not only because the uh, phenomenon, there are other phenomena in between, between the neural source that we want to know where they are located, and uh, uh, the signal that we want to use to control the uh, the uh, interface. Uh, the problem is that uh, the phenomena that uh, the metabolic and uh, hemodynamic phenomena are, uh, are also much slower, physically speaking, neurophysically speaking, than uh, electrical phenomena. So with the electrical phenomena, we are in the range of few tens or hundreds of milliseconds. As you learned before, we uh, normally target uh, uh, the P300. What does it mean? This means uh, that the response that is detected uh, is uh, uh, a peak of the uh, voltage at the electrode, 300, about 300 after the uh, stimulus arrives. So the target letter uh, appears, we are uh, thinking to that letter, and then after 300 we get the peak. 300 milliseconds. Uh, other people use even uh, faster events like the N1, uh, or they use uh, high frequency. You see the high frequency band. This you can do because you have a lot of temporal resolution. If you don't have a high temporal resolution in the order of uh, uh, kilohertz or megahertz, even better, uh, you cannot look at the, uh, at the high frequency uh, band for this. And, uh, this we don't have in fMRI, okay? Because in fMRI we have a very slow uh, uh, response. So if the stimuli occur at time zero, you see the the peak of the activity, which amounts in uh, at at clinical scanners uh, at three Tesla. So the the normal scanner for clinical research, and not it's uh, around the five percent of increase of the intensity. You see, comes between four and six seconds after the stimulus. So you can quickly imagine how big is this limitation for BCI. However, we can do some occasion, I can say BCI even faster than EG in a very special, in very specific uh, uh, situation. Uh, it depends on what we want to do with the BCI. The, the point is, uh, but this is uh, without uh, any uh, doubts, a big limitation. Okay, we cannot look at uh, signals in a, in a big frequency range because uh, uh, anyway, whatever change in the brain and we detect with fMRI will change over in this uh, time scale. So keep this in mind. This is very important. This is very important. So to summarize this thing, this is probably one of the oldest slides we have shown in our group, but it's always good to show for in uh, when you, uh, introduction. So uh, summarize how fMRI relates with respect to a, 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 a direct uh, electrical measurement of, like we could get with EEG uh, uh, and other tomographic measure. As, as you can see, fMRI gives you a temporal resolution which is two order of magnitude worse than EEG. However, gives you uh, more than uh, three, I, we can say oh, 
to nowadays, if we think to um, functional MRI at seven Tesla, higher, uh, higher spatial resolution that we can get compared to, uh, uh, to EG. This uh, aspect must be uh, very carefully taken into account when even when designing a normal fMRI experiment, but uh, specifically when designing an fMRI BCI. So the fact that uh, between the neural pathway, which is where the uh, activity occurs, and uh, uh, our uh, detector, which is the MRI scanner, there is this hemodynamic system in between which create a delay of the response of up to 4, 6 seconds. As you can see on the left and the right, you can uh, compare uh, the response to an ideal stimulus to, uh, which occurs during the red intervals. Uh, imagine that uh, on the left you see a stimulus which goes up during the red intervals on the timeline. And you see the counterpart on the fMRI signal. So you see a signal which is uh, delayed, or, but it's also smooth, the temporal is smooth in its form. You also see an undershoot too. This, this has been adequately modeled with the uh, so-called hemodynamic function, can via a linear convolution, is very useful to model the fMRI activity. But of course, we don't go into data. I want to only emphasize that uh, because I have said too many bad things, now I want to say very good things, uh, which makes fMRI not, uh, uh, a, a really uh, a big uh, amount of information about the brain. The fact that we can acquire with a single shot egoplanar imaging, we can cover the whole brain, and that means that we can sample the activity up to a few millions of little pieces of brain, of voxels of imaging, which is uh, three, four order of magnitude more of how the, the best grid that we can implant in a patient within an invasive PCI. So there is also the other way of thinking. Okay, time dynamics is not playing in favor of fMRI BCA. Let's work on space. If time is slow, is a slow aspect uh, of fMRI, let's see how can we counterbalance this loss of information in dynamics with a lot of formation with spatial dynamics. And that's exactly what people do when designing fMRI uh, 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 and DTI. Uh, here I would like to emphasize a bit more the uh, aspect, uh, the distinction between the two uh, crucial moments of a BCI. This is true in general for, for all BCI. Uh, there is always this training phase, which is sometimes called a learning or phase or encoding phase. They are more or less uh, uh, synonyms. Uh, it depends on the context. Uh, it's the crucial uh, stage where a machine, a computer program, learns how to uh, uh, link the amount of information that we, we put from the fMRI patterns and the external world. Either they are stimuli or uh, realistic uh, uh, environment. Imagine in the virtual, uh, they, you saw some examples of combination of BCI with virtual reality. Then if you think to virtual reality, you can imagine to frame the virtual reality movies as a series of uh, uh, scenarios, experience. So, uh, uh, pro, uh, su suitable uh, algorithms, uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms will make this uh, uh, job of uh, uh, linking uh, the fMRI patterns to the uh, data that we collect from the uh, external world or from the signal. This means Learning rules, learning, learning functions, learning uh, massively multivariate functions that uh, uh, um, with enough statistical confidence and minimal overfitting, I will not go into the details because this pertains to the uh, um, theory of the uh, artificial intelligence, which is a, a part of signal processing, which deals how this learning is uh, performed. 
And then there is the, uh, the visible part of the BCI, where once that these rules, this function are calculated, uh, the, 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 the job becomes very easy because it's only a matter to collect data and then uh, extract the pattern and from the pattern trans translating, transforming the pattern into actions, into prediction uh, and, and command. Uh, in this uh, uh, part, there is, uh, uh, it's, very, it's very easy, it has been very well uh, shown in the previous. We have seen very much the, uh, let's say, the testing, the action part of the BCI, uh, a bit less of how the training uh, uh, is, uh, uh, really works. Because there are several aspects which uh, uh, make this training stage crucial in the project, especially for the... Uh, Concerning the second part, the second part is the part where, which must uh, work in real time. So the first part, in normally in fMRI, can be performed uh, uh, offline or online. Online is different from real time. In sense, it's online uh, means that it's performed, for instance, while the subject is in the scanner, but not during uh, necessarily during. Uh, uh, so not in real time. In real time means that the uh, calculation are performed uh, uh, in real time with the acquisition. So for each uh, frame of the uh, Econ-Flannel frame that is acquired, there is a calculation going on, and the results is immediately uh, given back to the subject. So the training part can be offline or online optimized. The uh, real time, uh, the prediction part is, uh, or com action part must be uh, offline. Can be. So, a very, very brief. No, me dite quanto tempo c'ho. Quanto tempo c'ho? Sì. No, io volevo fare qualche esempio. No, io no, non ho molto, eh. Io credo di avere non più di 10-15 minuti. Mm? Uh, quindi, uh, sorry, uh, so real-time fMRI. Uh, it's fMRI, but with some uh, additional uh, prerequisite, which are quite obvious. So you must allow the online observation. Of the, it is used for quality uh, assurance, and as we see, the uh, experimental uh, FM must be adaptive. And this is important for BCI application, and especially for neurofeedback. Okay? What is neurofeedback? It's, uh, neurofeedback must be now quite clear. So the idea is that uh, if we uh, can uh, take the activity from the uh, subject in real time, can translate this into an information which can immediately deliver back to the subject. That's the uh, tool by which we can control our own activity. Since in fMRI we can be highly selective for the region of interest, in neurofeedback with fMRI what we do is to target the region and help the subject to self-control the activity from that region. And that's the crucial part of all BCI training uh, stages. Okay, I hope this is clear enough. See, this is how the setup is, is, uh, is modified. I will show now a number of uh, slides of application from uh, a PhD thesis uh, of a student in Maastricht, Bettina Serger, who has worked a lot on an fMRI uh, neurofeedback, and we are now sharing uh, the data I will show you in this presentation for further development. So you see how the setup has been modified. The uh, data from the scanner can go into a special software which must do a real-time data analysis. Uh, this must allow the user to select the regions. I want to select uh, a hippocampus or visual cortex, in the same way uh, uh, um, Gunther shows 
uh, I select the visual uh, cord, uh, electrodes. No, but in that case, we uh, browse through the brain exactly in that region. And uh, the signal from that region is translated into a, uh, um, an, an easy to use, uh, uh, an easy to understand uh, uh, um, image. The, the, the simplest thing you can do, you can imagine a thermometer of the activity. So the user sees the thermometer of his activity in the, in the target region. That's how we close the loop of neurofeedback. Just to a very brief uh, window on the clinical application of neurofeedback. So I'm not talking of, of uh, uh, BCI. I will show later on uh, a BCI. But uh, the only fact that we use feedback, which we have already uh, seen is so important for the training of the BCI, for the performance of the BCI, the feedback alone, the neurofeedback, can be used to have some behavioral effect or some clinical effect. For instance, the, the typical neurofeedback protocol, you see there are periods where the subject is just resting, it's similar as before, and the period during which the subject's doing some usually imagery tasks, so imagine the movements or something like that. Imagine that this experiment uh, is not uh, uh, necessarily for treatment or a one-day experiment. This is normally repeated over weeks. So you will not see improvement uh, in your neurofeedback uh, in one day. Okay, this is, of course, pertains to neurofeedback. So you must repeat the session over time. So you normally do uh, first a run where you, uh, that we call localizer, where you uh, detect the regions that you want the target for neurofeedback. And then once you, are, uh, you have fi 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 found the region, that's very similar to what has shown before on the patient. For instance, in this experiment of motor fluency uh, is uh, uh, detected uh, supplementary motor region uh, in the brain. And then uh, there come the neurofeedback runs where the subjects uh, alternating rest uh, with period of rest is asked to, uh, control, to, act, to imagine the task and control and get the feedback of the level of activity which is measured via this, uh, this loop. This has been done uh, uh, in, uh, um, in normal uh, people, normal subject. And uh, you see here, just to be fast, I will not go into details because this will require a lot of explanation. But imagine that uh, uh, we have uh, compared the, um, the, the quality of the task, of the movement task, which was a finger thumbing task, so, uh, this, this kind of task. And we can count the number of taps in, uh, per minute, I think. The number of taps to see how good, how fast are you in doing this task. No? And, uh, uh, the, the comparison here is between patient uh, subjects who uh, perform this task after a session of uh, uh, um, uh, neurofeedback and subjects who did not do neurofeedback, just do the, the task without doing the, uh, the neurofeedback of the activity in the SME. As you can see, uh, there, is, oh, there is always a better uh, performance of the subjects doing uh, uh, neurofeedback during the task with the, with the feedback compared to sub control subjects who do, do not do the feedback. And this, the gap between the group, the experimental group, and the group is maximal after uh, a number of treatments. And this was done exactly because, thanks to fMRI, we had uh, targeted a number of regions uh, who put, uh, uh, and then optimized the region uh, for uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, giving back uh, the signal to the user. And this has been also done by another group uh, with using the regions uh, involved in emotion control, and specifically in uh, depressed patients. Patients suffering depression uh, have normally a dysfunctional uh, emotional network. So what they did, they used the same, exactly the same uh, protocol uh, as before, um, and uh, compare 
Uh, of course, uh, the regions were this time different because the regions uh, which were involved in the in emotional network like uh, anterior cingulate cortex, amygdala, ventral striato, insula, a number of uh, networks important for the uh, uh, controlling uh, the emotion. And uh, they again compare uh, uh, the amount of depression of the patient after, uh, after undergoing this, uh, uh, this treatment. And they saw that there was uh, an improvement, so there was a reduction of the depression score in patients who were engaged in uh, doing this activity. So the only fact of using this signal um, uh, of brain activity as a feedback to the user, of course, organized in, in a certain, with certain uh, precise schedule of time, so a certain number of sessions, has worked to improve either the quality of a, a motor task or the uh, uh, depression score of this patient. So this is something which uh, uh, has been uh, looked with uh, a certain attention. And I want to conclude with uh, uh, an fMRI-based BCI. This is a true BCI, which, uh, I, although I didn't know, I, I selected uh, uh, this work always from Bettina Tesi, Bettina Sorga Tesi, thesis, um, which is very similar to the, is a speller, so a BCI who uh, writes uh, uh, the letter that you think. But uh, um, uh, it's... So uh, in the design, is very similar to the speller which I've shown with GI. It's only a bit uh, slower. But uh, it's a, a very um, nice example of how you use spatiotemporal characteristics of hemodynamic uh, response in fMRI uh, for uh, creating a BCI. So I think this is a very instructive example. So the first path, as I say, is uh, always uh, uh, a localizing part. So always a decision of how the, the, the task should be selected for the training phase, for uh, being sure that we can activate uh, a set of regions which is reproducible within and between different subjects. And for this, they were uh, used the three, uh, um, three tasks which uh, 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 included uh, um, Mental calculation, so the subject had to uh, make some mathematical calculation in his mind. So, uh, or inner speech, so the, the subject has to think to uh, speak. Huh? So does not have, have to program, but has to think to speak. And uh, the other one uh, is uh, um, motor imagery, so the same that uh, have been used in the example, too. so thinking to, to move. So all the uh, standard fMRI uh, analysis uh, have been performed. So there, there's, a, there have, there's been a, a, a group analysis performed to understand what are the regions uh, that activate in the different tasks, and also a report uh, uh, of all the Talara coordinates, so the coordinate, the standard coordinates in the brain where all the activity occurs in all subjects. This is very important to optimize the region in each subject, and this is normally done offline in a period, in a pilot uh, period uh, of the uh, experimental design. And then comes the uh, encoding scheme, which is what will determine the real training uh, part of the BCI. And as you will see, it's very similar to the spelling guide. The only difference is that uh, uh, here uh, we, uh, uh, it is used uh, the, these three mental, the, these three mental tasks, a combination of mental tasks and of uh, timing of the hemodynamic response. What, what I mean in the timing? So uh, you can see uh, there are three different, there can be, uh, there are three different tasks, so mental imagery, mental calculation, and mental and inner speech. And then there are uh, uh, three possibility for uh, the onset delay, so how, when the uh, response starts uh, compared to the moment the subject wants to uh, communicate the letter. And another, another important parameter is the duration of the uh, 
um, the duration of the, um, of the thought. So if I do, for instance, mental calculation, uh, uh, I can decide to make mental calculation for 10 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Okay? So by combining all uh, these, these features in this way, uh, which re will result in different shape of the hemodynamic response, so which lasts short, intermediate, or long response, or uh, uh, very uh, early, uh, intermediate latency, and uh, uh, late. By combining all these features, uh, I can uh, um, guess which letter is uh, uh, thought by the subject. And there comes the, uh, the, in the, the real uh, um, experiment in the uh, training race or encoding. So we, what is called encodic run. So the, the, the run the, during which uh, all the uh, fMRI activity are encoding, encoding a specific letter. So uh, in, uh, for during the uh, letter encoding period, there are some uh, groups of letters which uh, are highlighted on, in the board. And these this letters are characterized by the fact that all share the same property uh, 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 of the uh, fMRI response along one of the three axes. So uh, the subjects learn how to uh, associate the uh, um, latency and time and duration of the thinking to the letter. This, at the beginning, when they told me, I thought it was very, very difficult. Of course, it's much more difficult than uh, the letter which... Uh, and, but then, by seeing the performances, I was so surprised to see that this in, was very fast to work. And, uh, uh, in fact, they, they, were, uh, they reached quite, uh, in only one session, uh, basically reached quite uh, good uh, performance. So the subject... Uh, 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 is capable to encode uh, all the letters, also uh, special characters. So the idea is what happens is that in the last uh, stage, so the, in, the, in the decoding runs, what happens is that um, for each trial, uh, so there is a time window, and uh, in the time window all the, the signal is extracted, and uh, uh, you see the signal, this is the real signal that we measure from the ROIs, uh, and uh, these signals are uh, compared with the uh, uh, model functions uh, that you see here in this row, and depending on the cross-correlation uh, all, with all the model functions, uh, the uh, speller makes the choice on which uh, uh, letter is uh, doing. And this is the final results. Uh, for uh, uh, when, uh, where the subjects uh, become, uh, learn how to um, encode very fast the letter, and then there can be a, a real intercession conversation between the experimenter and the subject in the scanner, uh, uh, because the, uh, the experimenter makes a question, and then the subject starts uh, uh, to uh, encode the letter. And here you can have a, a, a look at the, uh, uh, at the results. There are, of course, uh, errors during the conversation, but most of the time uh, it is still possible to understand what are the, uh, response, the response of the subject. For instance, here, the uh, experiment say, what is your hobby? Photography, with no error. And then, uh, what, uh, what did, uh, what, where, probably, what did you photograph, ah, where, what did you photograph last? My home. You see there is, uh, there is an, er an, er an error here, and, but still uh, uh, by visualizing these uh, results, you can still say, uh, so you can imagine uh, that this has the same application with the, uh, patients who cannot communicate, actually, in this, uh, can do this via the scan. The nice thing of this approach is that uh, uh, when using the uh, rank ordering of the correlations between the uh, uh, fMRI signals and the uh, model signals, uh, actually all the letters become ordered. So there is always a first choice and second choice. That's very nice because you see here when there is a mistake in the, in a, in the first choice, 
you can still look at the second choice to see whether this makes sense or not. And this can work, uh, uh, has been shown to work on a current biology paper also um, we, uh, in a one uh, afternoon uh, session. So in one afternoon session, you first do a localizer. In the localizer, the subjects uh, is uh, just the, do the task. So in their speech, mental calculation, and, uh, and uh, uh, motor imagery. Uh, and then we we use this localizing task for mapping the brain region. Then you choose the brain regions, uh, go to the second stage, and there is the encoding, uh, letter encoding task, where the subjects uh, uh, learn how to uh, ma uh, uh, control the timing of his thought uh, with the letter. And then there is the, from that moment on, the communication can work on a single trial level uh, the, where the time window is the, is the order on the 40, 60 seconds. So the time you need to measure uh, a, complete, uh, a complete response to that, uh, which will be now entered in the... You know. So um, this is just one example which comes from... A group. Of course, this uh, requires a lot of improvements which pertain both at the localizer stage, how to best select multiple regions. Uh, one, one very good advantage, which was mentioned also in the video, is that here we really have a number of degrees of freedom, very high, because we can decide whether using one region or multiple regions together, uh, and this makes a difference in how good the performance will be of the speller. And also, uh, um, uh, um, show that despite the um, limited uh, temporal uh, resolution of fMRI, still we can uh, uh, quite precisely control uh, the, uh, the timing of this uh, response. Okay? This is a, if you have questions... Uh, When I, when I talked to Fabrizio uh, yesterday, he said, that I am not an expert of BCI, so, uh, but, uh, <laughs> yes, I know, but he, 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 he did, uh, he, he did, uh, yes, just um, a, a lecture where he introduced so many, so many aspects important concerning BCI. And uh, uh, I think it's because he is much more than I expect <laughs> today. Um, uh, now, he, uh, now we realize that, uh, uh, and especially concerning neurofeedback, that the fMRI is, uh, uh, contains uh, so much, uh, a huge amount of information that can be used for make BCI more readable. Because uh, the synthesis, the neurofeedback is more or less uh, the, same, the, the same loop that we could use for training BCI, and uh, and uh, and the the, the 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 goal to make a BCI interface more reliable is uh, the most important goal, and I think uh, this is one of the match the more the, the the biggest item that we look we look for the, uh, uh, the, the the further research. Uh, now uh, I have. Uh, uh, I have my presentation concerning uh, what we are doing uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in synapse concerning uh, the uh, and why we start uh, to pay interest concerning uh, BCI. Uh, but I will not take so much time because. Uh, uh, more or less, some of the things we are discussing, we are uh, we are discussing about, uh, is more or less already outlined by the presentation of uh, of, of Guger and also by Fabrizio. It's clear to everybody that the BCI is a, 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 an important challenge for the main computer interface. And the main computer interface is, the, is an important point for 
disabled persons, in particular disabled students. This is, the, this is why we are interested about that uh, as a synopsis, because uh, many, some of our students could take uh, advantage from have a, an, an efficient main uh, computer interface like BCI. Of course, uh, university students are not so many in this situation because, uh, not because, uh, because uh, of course, uh, a severe disabled persons, it's uh, difficult that try to, to start university challenge because people stay at home. Of course, if some see the opportunity, that goes to see the opportunity through a new main machine interface like BCI, he could take courage about that. He could start. So it's important to invest about, about this item. Of course, uh, and the, our responsibility is to don't take an illusion, to don't give an illusion to students. So if uh, I promise to a student to stay at home that is a cyber disabled, that he can uh, study by using BCI interface, it must be reliable about that. He don't spend his whole day, I see, time consuming. For instance, we have uh, some other interface like uh, eyes interface, the ocular control, that are uh, well, uh, 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 there are some uh, uh, well known and many people think that through ocular control computer is easy to use a computer is not easy is a very time consuming is a, is a, is a, it's an hard job it can do but it's an hard job and so at the same t and uh, as well BCI can be used, but it's still time consuming. So much more work has to be spent in research for make BCI more reliable and to make the BCI interface more efficient in order to give real opportunity to university students. And uh, uh, so that's the reason that we, and the, the synapse can do more can we so much about that because a synapse can provide service to students. So if a student wants to start, synapse can give, stay with him for training, for configuration of equipments, for manage the equipments in order to make more available and more efficient. This is the synapse roles and uh, uh, that's the reason because we start to look, but in a very pragmatic way, to look to, uh, and we bought some of BCI equipments in order to use with our students. The first step that, to, and the first step because we are not uh, as a synapse interested in studying in research, but in really use with disabled students. And the first step is how to arrange the use of BCI in order to make it use to make it usable to students, and uh, uh, and with the, 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 a couple of uh, dissertation theses concerning the configuration of BCI for using it to try to how to arrange it for uh, make it practical usable. Okay just to say, per essere più chiaro in italiano, il nostro sforzo è stato quello di capire come usare le BCI per renderle praticamente usabili al di là di quelli che sono, diciamo, gli aspetti, tra virgolette, di possibilità, di pubblicità o di esercizio. Non deve essere un esercizio, così il real practical use must be uh, sustainable must be really manageable. That's not just to an, a, a practical exercise, because it's daily to use and the people invest to the possibility to study and to use BCI. So, uh, and a couple of students, is, uh, Dario Pappalardo and uno di voi venga, hanno did some practice about uh, BCI and uh, 
they make their dissertation thesis. I invite him to explain how they use BCI, which was, was the problems that they meet in the real practical use, just for understanding probably some mistake that we did in use it, probably for, just for give to Google the, uh, the, the, the overlook which was our experience about the practical use of BCI in order to use, make more fruitful the, year, the afternoon session in order to better understanding how to, to, to use this device. Okay? Uh, shall I computer? So as Professor Pepino said, we just tried to make um, good use of the device with both. And in the moment we decide, in the moment we decide to both the device, we just, we just made a decision based on some study that was made before, that was about um, commercializable devices um, in a price range that was between $200 and $1,000. And um, in the study, they classified the devices on the basis of some points that were, that were about uh, the number of channels and uh, about the usability and about um, some other aspect uh, in a range that was from 1 to 13. And we decided to buy the, the Epoch uh, produced by Emotive, just because it was the um, uh, the first one in the in the in the chart. So we, as, as Professor Pepino said, we just take this device and we didn't analyze. We, we used it like a black box. We just didn't analyze all the signals and all the rest. We were trying to use it straight as the um, as it as it came from the as it came from the Emotive that produced it. So we take the software de development kit and it comes with this control panel that shows a cube in a 3D and the user was able to move it. Um, originally it can be spinned around in both centers and it can go farther and back to the user, right, left and up and down. We just decided to use this software as it came from the, from the producer. Um, to use this software, you just look at the signal that it shows. Maybe it's um, usually it was an arrow in a side, right side, left side, up or down. And the task for the user was just to mental imagine the task that you got to do. Um, we used eight subjects. Seven of, the, seven of them, we, sh uh, we just explained them how to imagine the movement. For the right hand, they got to just... Uh, grasp their hand just like they were um, taking a tennis ball in their hand and for the for the up arrow they just have to do it with both hands and down just with feet just like they were trying to grab something something on the ground um, of course um, using um, sensory model based uh, BCIs we need to know that the user got to learn how to imagine the movement, and at the same time, the machine got to learn and got to improve the, um, the signal that came from the user. Um, we just tried to make this set just to search how to make a working paradigm, a training paradigm for the users, and we started every session with, um, with showing on the screen. Um, every subject was seated in a comfortable chair, about a meter and a half from the screen. 
um, the first thing was the training. And we used to do three training per person. So the first thing, the user sh um, just see a, an arrow on the screen and get to think about the right side, the left side, imagine what, what, we, what, we, told, what we told them. Um, just for 10 seconds. During these 10 seconds, uh, we decided not to show any feedback to the users because there was uh, a study of Professor Guger just about three, uh, 2003, I think, that from one side, the feedback, it's a good thing for the user just because he can imagine what he's going to do so he can improve his, his, his motor imagery. On the other hand, sometimes it gets frustrating because if you stare at the, at the cube and it doesn't move, it just gets a little bit annoying. So we decided not to show the feedback to seven subjects. We showed feedback just to one. Um, during the training, there was an operator that was behind the computer and he was starting the registration from the control panel. That was what we asked um, the subject to imagine. So right hand movement, uh, left hand movement, right hand movement, both hands and both feet. Um, the old run was about 20 minutes of duration. We just have the training for every movement with three repetitions. And it took about 50 seconds. So between one and the other, we just wait about 10 seconds just to, make, to, to take some rest. And then we made three trials. Uh, there was 10 repetitions with uh, random, random arrows, right and left, up and down, and all four direction. Everyone took about 2 minutes and 35, so the whole thing was uh, during about 20 minutes. Um, during these 20 minutes, there was an operator that, was, um, that got to just take note of what was happening to the tube because the user didn't have the feedback. So we decided that approximately if the cube just reached two-thirds of the, of the whole length in the si right side or left side, it was a good, um, a, a good accomplishment. Otherwise, it was an error if it, were, if it was going in the wrong direction or something like that. Um, okay. Of the eight subject, uh, we did from 3 to 21 run without feedback and with feedback. But uh, usually we, we used to do a standard test that was one, one per day. It, it took about 20 minutes. And we tried to make an, an intensive test. And we just stopped when the, when the when user get, uh, just stressed or fatigued. So um, we, we tried to make a, some cross trials with all four directions. But we just noticed that it was really frustrating because for the machine, it was easy to discern between just two directions, just like uh, left or right. But it was very hard to discern between four patterns that was up, down, right, and left because I thought they were maybe they got similar. So if you, you just try to talk right and they were going in another direction. Uh, we just take this elementary methods just for um, evaluate the performance of BCI. That was just the accuracy and the error rate. That was the easiest method that we can take. And uh, the percentage and the medium accuracy and error rate are not that good because we just reached the 50% about. But we can notice that just uh, use number four, just reached the 20% in, uh, in accuracy in up and down. That was because we didn't tell, we didn't tell him uh, how to imagine the movement. And he told us when he asked him that he imagined just to move his hands up and his hands down just for up and down. But we know that the cortex the motor cortex just got a portion, a region for hands and for foot, just to discriminate to signals and to patterns. Uh, okay, uh, there was interesting in the subject number three, it just reached the 50% of accuracy after two runs. So it was, we thought that maybe doing more runs and more tests just can improve its performance. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, this is the error rate, and it just get 
smaller and smaller, just in seven, eight runs. So it's probably that making more runs, error rate can just get to very low values. Uh, we did a database with Microsoft Access just to keep trace of what was happening. And when we did it, we just wanted to make something that was uh, something like multi-purpose database. So if there's someone else that is working on the same things or doing some other tests with some other subject, you can join the same database just to share with everybody this, the results so everybody can take trace of what's happening in another study or something like that. Of course, there will be uh, a lot of um, improvements. Uh, first of all, we just made the tests on eight subjects and probably uh, may, taking a wider range of population may, can make better results. Uh, we didn't analyze the signal um, features. Uh, we didn't extract them from the the sort of black box, we just take the device as it, as it was. So it would be great just to can uh, analyze the signals and its characteristics just to extract the features that most interest us. And we can develop the database. And it would be a dream just to have a database that everybody can share. So the results of everybody can be seen from other studies and other university or something like that. And to just uh, improve the SDK just to make a automatic environment so that the user that may have to make the training doesn't need anybody around him and he can do it on his own. That's it. Thank you, Dario. Um, as you seen uh, uh, here, uh, I reported the difficulties just for, uh, for me to getting uh, uh, robust results. Uh, now probably something, uh, now we could, have, we could go deeply in the afternoon concerning the procedure. Probably was a device that is uh, not uh, uh, reliable enough for collecting the signals, it's not clear. I don't know, but of course uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the mistake percentage was very, was very high. And, uh, it's something probably you not know, works exactly. Uh, now uh, Gian, uh, Gianluigi, uh, Gian, Gian Giulio, Anton, Anton Giulio uh, will report his experience. Uh, where uh, some uh, little bit work a step ahead was done on uh, other, for other, other uh, possibilities of the, what we have at the present stage, of course. And of course, we look forward how to improve our setup to improve the effectiveness of, uh, of the work, to improve the reliability. My, my idea, and uh, please uh, uh, make your comment, my idea is that, uh, uh, of course, we should have the possibility to go, uh, to go deeply in the equipment just in order to collect it, to, uh, to better uh, have the, uh, the check of the, uh, of the equipment set up in order to, to be confident about uh, the, what we are picking, we are collecting, because what, this was one of the, of the difficulties that we had few months ago. And uh, one more point is uh, how to uh, arrange a, 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 a procedure, an experiment setup uh, that is not so time consuming. Because of course, the, the, uh, the, the possibility to have uh, a, 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 an easy and efficient setup is uh, make uh, all the arrangements more, more reliable and more robust. If it's time consuming and uh, is hard to, to, to arrange, it's more easy to make mistake and uh, so on. So, Don Giulio now will very quickly will report his experience. After that, please start to make comment, to make, uh, ask questions to uh, Chris, uh, to Fabrizio, and so on, even 
Chris, please, uh, if you have some question to, to make to us, no problem, before, just before lunch, and uh, after that, the lunch will, uh, will wait us. So, hi everyone, I'm Anton Giulio Grande, and uh, I'm a, a student of biomedical engineering. In the, um, I'm doing a master's degree and at the end of my universal, university career. Um, my thesis uh, work of the, um, of the bachelor of degree, so at the end of my three, um, three years, was on the, a BCI based on um, a P300 uh, speller and uh, a test environment on BCI 2000. And uh, now I'm going to explain what is this. Um, so, the test environment is um, an emotive epoch. Uh, that is the, the same uh, device that uh, Dario explained before. So, a, um, a net set with 16 uh, electrodes and two reference. Um, the, um, the, the software instead is BCI 2000. That is um, a, an open source, um, an open source um, environment, and uh, if uh, uh, someone is interested, uh, he could uh, download it on BCI2000.org. Um, it's very one of the tasks of BCI2000 team is to create a, um, a sort of um, community of BCI uh, of BCI users. So uh, it's very it's very interesting. This is the logo. And uh, at the end, the, the, application, the, the application of BCI 2000 is uh, the FD uh, P300 speller. It is a, communi uh, a communicator with an alphanumerical uh, matrix, the, this one. And uh, FD is for the two very first uh, scientists that started this, uh, co this uh, communicator, Farwell and Donchin, Donchin in 1988. Uh, P300 is uh, a wave that we already seen before is um, a wave that uh, is elicited uh, after uh, three or, or 400 um, milliseconds uh, that we have the, the stimulus. It, it is also called um, a, a cognitive spy, because uh, uh, every time that we see a, um, uh, every time that we see a stimulus, then we have a, um, a, a signal like that. Uh, it, uh, it is very important to as a signal um, in a common signal of BCI have um, a, a feature like this. My aim was to very, uh, verify reliability and performance reachable with uh, a low-cost uh, BCI. Um, so, one of the um, of the most important um, uh, one of the most, uh, of the most imp important. Um, challenge that a, a, a new BCI a, a new BCI user can see is the um, the calibration session. Well, what is in literature is called uh, training. Uh, this means that uh, when a person see uh, um, starts to communicate with a, with a machine, the machine will learn on the uh, on the person. We uh, all, we usually see that the, the person have to uh, communicate with the, with the machine, so it is a paradox. It's, a, it's very interesting. Uh, after that, uh, after this calibration session, so the, uh, this, tra uh, this training, we will see uh, the offline that data analysis that uh, is very important, and at the end we will see the free spelling. Um, Go, going uh, very very faster on this uh, on this slide, we see that uh, BCI 2000 has this, uh, has, uh, this uh, interface. Click on config, and uh, uh, we have some parameters that we can uh, that we can set. After that, channels as uh, offset, uh, high pass filter, and uh, and so on. Um, the most important part that we can see on this um, on this um, software is uh, the, the filtering. The filtering that, and we can see the P3 temporal filter that is very important. It is uh, very important because um, if we do the hypothesis that um, P3 and uh, that the AG uh, signal 
has a, 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 um, a Gaussian noise. So uh, we, with, the, um, with the average equal to zero, we could uh, go to a moving average filter with a window of, uh, in this case, 800 milliseconds, and epoch to average uh, 20, we, uh, we can see at the end the, um, uh, the P300. Uh, the most important part that, uh, that we can see is the linear classifier. Linear classifier that um, in, inside of this, um, of, of this uh, classifier we will see the whole calibration session. That is uh, the, the main issue, the, the main problem of the NeoFit uh, user of BCI. And so, calibration session, we um, have to copy spelling three sentences. Uh, we, can, uh, we can write these sentences. In this case, uh, this is the first um, uh, sentence, spelling in the rain. And um, um, when we see the P300 paradigm, it is elicited by uh, the, the classical hotball paradigm. That is, a several, um, several pulses, uh, several uh, non-target um, non-target uh, signals and uh, randomly a target signal. And uh, every time we see a randomly uh, target signal, we elicitate a P300 signal. We already seen this, uh, the, uh, this before. And uh, uh, so, or we see uh, just, a just a ladder that, uh, that is uh, enlightened, or, uh, or as we see before, there is a, a row and, uh, and a column. At the end, uh, sorry. Uh, we will see. Uh, no, we won't see the the, uh, the letter because this is the calibration session. So as well, as Dario said before, uh, in this uh, in this case, the feedback is not uh, um, is better if we if we don't show the the letter um, spells because uh, it's of course uh, it's wrong because it's a calibration session. So the, um, another. Uh, problem. Uh, the, the main problem of the of the BCI is uh, uh, the offline analysis. Um, BCI 2000 can give us two um, two, two softwares that uh, are very robust, uh, are very good to um, to begin to uh, interface with uh, with these devices. The first is uh, the, um, the offline analysis. Um, in this uh, we we have. Um, um, a, a graphic like this, and um, we can see on the on the y-axis channels of the um, of the um, edge, uh, of the uh, of the device EG. Uh, on the uh, on the x-axis we can see the time, and uh, and at the end the person uh, the person person coefficient. Uh, that is a, a, a correlation. On, uh, on, the, on this map, we can see the red, um, the red areas where the P300 is uh, more probably to, um, to see. We, on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on this scheme, we can take the, um, some, uh, some, uh, some parameters, so channels and time, and, uh, and with this, we, go, uh, we can go on the... Um, we can then elaborate. The second one is called P300 classifier. That is a very important. Is the main part of the of this um, of this uh, of the soft of these two softwares. Uh, this P300 classifier is a classical cl classifier. The is a linear classifier uh, with the stepwise linear discriminant analysis. Anyway, a linear classifier can let us to say if an event um, is um, th there is an event or uh, or not. Ha anyway. Um, going uh, going beyond of this uh, of this uh, on the on, the, on this uh, uh, okay. things we can uh, at the end do um, a free spelling session that is the end this was uh, our our goal our goal and uh, and then we can use this um, this uh, this, uh, this this this, uh, this device uh, for my personal. Uh, my personal experience, my, my first word was spelled was uh, novecento, and novecento, ev every, every letter, so N, O, and so on, was highlighted uh, 60 times. So it, it's very, uh, it's, a, it's very, 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 very slow. 
Um, but when uh, I got how, how it works, uh, I could um, enlight every word for, for times. And, uh, and so the results was four letters per minute and uh, a precision of, of the uh, accuracy of uh, 82%. In uh, Lichard, we can see 7.8 with 100% of, uh, of spangling rate. And uh, talking before with, uh, with, with Professor uh, De Luca, he said to me that uh, uh, they actually have done a, um, a, an accuracy of uh, 100% in, uh, in five minutes. My work uh, was uh, on, uh, on two months. And uh, I have to say that uh, in the beginning, I was driving in the dark because uh, uh, I, I, really, I really didn't know how HPCI works, and uh, uh, it was very frustrating to, uh, because I, I, I haven't my, uh, uh, my, uh, my results. And uh, just with, uh, with the help of my, uh, my tutor, uh, General Siciliano, and then Dario Pappalardo, uh, we, uh, we at the end saw that stressing parameters and so going to 6 enlightenment that is very very slow we we saw that uh, effectively this uh, this device uh, can work uh, obviously uh, we we were we were wrong or something but at the end uh, pr proudly i i i reached this uh, these results and uh, conclu conclusions at uh, I, I brought this thesis two years uh, ago, so the, um, uh, the state of the art changed. Uh, this is, uh, um, this is uh, um, a, surfing, a surfing net uh, uh, software, and uh, I know that actually is very, is very, um, is very tested. Uh, anyway, uh, oh, thanks uh, for the attention. Thank you. Now uh, is uh, always uh, it's, it's always al almost at uh, the lunch time, and uh, even if you are probably angry, I I stimulate uh, your uh, your comments, your questions. Italian question, please. I I will try to translate. Questo è un paradigma standard che viene adottato, l'odd ball paradigm di cui, di cui hanno parlato anche prima. Praticamente il sistema riconosce la reazione eh, che spontaneamente avviene quando tu compi una reazione, nel nostro caso era contare, quando si illumina la riga che contiene il, lo stimolo target, quindi la lettera A per esempio, tu inizi a fare una cosa, involontariamente e spontaneamente produci quel famoso segnale di 300, il sistema dopo la fase di calibrazione addestramento eccetera eccetera è in grado di riconoscerlo e quindi sa che in corrispondenza di quell'evento, si è illuminata quella riga, si è verificato eh, il segnale, dopodiché si, verificano altre, si illuminano altre righe, non c'è il segnale, dopodiché si illumina una colonna in cui ci sta la lettera che ti interessa, c'è il segnale, quando randomicamente questa operazione viene fatta un po' di volte, si incrociano i dati e il sistema fa la sintesi e dice ok. Eh, sì. Diciamo con, con una battaglia navale con predizione. Va. Vabbè. Comunque ok, è chiaro. More questions? Ok, just for concluding, there are some uh, point of attention. The first is the training. The system must be trained. The training of the system is one focal point because the training is efficient, it's not time consuming and it's efficient, the system works, works better. 
if the training is not effective, it's time consuming and so on, the system doesn't work, it's not realable. So one point is how to train in few time and the best way. One more focal point is uh, possible application of BCI. Of course, the main application is main computer interface, but how? With feedback or without feedback? There is one point that's, that's to be outlined in the afternoon. The tray and the BCI can be used as a rehabilitation support in a, for, for instance, is a neurofeedback and back to the training. The training can be done by support of fMRI or not. So uh, there are different directions for trying to use the BCI as a supporting of rehabilitation or as a support to the, as a assistive device. In the case of use as assistive device, how and uh, how to make uh, more realable the training, and which are the possible solution for training in a few time and in the best way. This is a number of questions that we hope to have some uh, feedback in the afternoon, more practical, practical approach. Okay? Chris, have you questions, some questions? No? Okay. Uh. Hey, this is, yes, uh, you said that these sort of interactions. So if you want to spell, you have to look on the screen, of course, but if you steer a robot, you don't make so many decisions for a long time. You make one decision and then you can rest again. So you can switch off the BCI system or you can have some statistical analysis if you're looking at the screen so that decisions are done. And if you're not looking at the screen, then no decision is made. And, uh, in any case, uh, uh, more experience about that, more people who work and the, the, the improving the number of people that work and use such device can give feedback, can give back uh, information concerning uh, the experience of use. Now, uh, uh, there are so, so few cases where the, the, the equipment is used in practical and we have to consider the alternatives people use, but we have no alternatives to use handle because can use just the, uh, this device, and so. Concerning the spelling device, uh, for instance, for the letter, uh, for the letter production, how uh, does the system compare in terms of cost and performance with, uh, with an eye tracking system which tracks the, the eye and... Uh so 
So, so the eye tracking system is using mostly a camera that's fixed under the screen and it has two cameras tracking X and Y positions of the eyes and you, you can have X and Y control and if you want to select an icon you stay for one, two seconds on the icon and then a selection is done. This is how they work and if you want to switch it off you have to look on the bottom of the screen and after some seconds it's switched off. Uh, so the costs are about the same. Uh, the m most problematic part is distribution, for example, of eye trackers and, and the service you have to provide. It's the same for the BCI system. So if an eye tracker was, would cost 500 euros, no, nobody would sell it because you have to go there, you have to work with the patient, you have to do an installation. If it doesn't work, you have to come back and do all this stuff. And this is all financed by the price of the eye tracker because a service structure doesn't exist. That's the reason why system costs about 10,000 euros, because it's just not possible to provide it otherwise to patients. It's the same for BCI systems, so you also need support. You have to visit patients, you have to calibrate it and update it and all this time, and this is all financed by the price of the system. So it wouldn't work if it costs only 1,000 euros. Nobody could provide it. And if you look at the performance, then some patients prefer to use eye trackers, some patients prefer to use BCI systems, but there are also patients who don't have eye movements left, so you need BCI systems uh, to select the characters. And if patients don't have eye gaze at all, then there is a, a simple trick that you can do. Instead of having the characters beside each other, you just have the characters behind each other, and they are just showing up one after each other, and then you just have to focus on one single spot on the screen, and you can communicate. And there's also another nice advantage of BCI system. They don't follow you all the time. So the eye tracker is always following your eye gaze, and, and sometimes you don't want to have that. And with the, I, with the BCI system, you are free. And of course, it's not only X and Y position, it's also, you know, different motor commands that you induce, that you can use for control signals. So you get many, much more degrees of freedom for realizing applications. Uh, one more about the uh, eye tracking system that we, we will know and uh, because uh, in a number of cases we have used, uh, we, we, uh, we studied about, uh, we consider to use. My opinion is the eye tracker system is uh, already at the, at the end. So you cannot do more that you already done, do. You cannot improve more because uh, uh, this uh, is it's, 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 uh, at, uh, at the limit, the, the, the upper limit. In the case of BCI, you know, we are at the beginning. So the possibility of improvement in terms of performance that we have with BCI is quite much higher than uh, eye tracking. So EI can invest in eye tracking system. I invest in terms of know-how, in service, uh, people that use that is an investment that is uh, lost because uh, you cannot improve the performance. If you invest in BCI, you can have advantage because you can improve the performance and you, it's in, in, in terms of knowledge and experience, is much more effective rather than eye tracking. As, uh, tracking is uh, as one of the technologies uh, quite reliable, but in some cases, because he said correctly, there are a number of cases where people are not used, to, are not able to control the movement of high. So, but there are many cases where it's possible. In that case, it's quite reliable, but in any case, very tiring, very time consuming in any case. Okay. Any more comments? Professor? Hi. Um, in the videos that uh, you have shown uh, before, um, the, there wasn't uh, two, two these BCIs, right? Or uh, two-dimensional BCI, BCIs with uh, two, two signal in, uh, in the command. 
Um, is it... Uh, I heard... Um, in the videos that we have seen before, so in the, in the experimentation, we've seen um, BCI, uh, 1D BCIs, or I'm wrong, uh, I mean 2-dimensional two two BCIs. Uh, and is it possible to combine motor imagery and uh, ERP, like uh, P300, to create a 2-dimensional BCI? Okay, it's lunch time. <laughs>